Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Blandon Broadband Lunch Bunch, Digital Use and Equity. Uh, my name is Mary Magnuson, and I'm with the Blandon Foundation, and I just wanted to welcome you all here today. Um, Anne's going to be leading the session, so I'll just turn it right over to her. Thanks, Anne. Great. Great, great, and it's fun to see some new faces and some faces we see every month. So thanks for coming. Um, but a topic that I that I think is fascinating today, the universal basic broadband. But you know, I always like to start with introductions, especially if there's you know fewer than twelve of us. So I, you know, my name is Ann Tracy, and I write the Blandon on Broadband blog, and I've worked um, on a contract basis with Blandon for what fifteen years or something, long time, because I was seven when I started as we all were so that's um yeah i'm excited to talk about this maybe we'll just go around i know barbara you want to be next just tell us sure barbara drew klein lisa county broadband planning coming off of four days at the fair it was great we had talked to hundreds of people about broadband it was very very cool kind of exhausting uh, we're glad we didn't have the bad weather the last couple of days. We did take the tent down, put it back up Friday night, but the weather wasn't that bad. And still, still hoping and waiting for RDOF to get resolved so we can move ahead on some stuff, but it was a great time. Well, we've got some new people. So if you wanted to even take an extra minute or two to talk about your situation, Lisa, sure. so you guys have been working really hard for a long time. Yeah, thank you. So um, we started in 2018 when uh, Bill Coleman came out and told us what to do. And uh, we got a great grant approved in 2019 for two townships that are being finished up to the door right now. 2020, our application was declined because of RDOF, which has like two thirds of our county potentially gonna get federal dollars. So that stalled us out a lot. Uh, we did a lot with our CARES Act dollars last year. We spent a, a million and a half on broadband, fixed wireless, and fiber. So and again, Barbara, Lee being, we being LeSueur County as a county, county, right? Correct. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so the county has been great. We're trying to figure out what we're going to be able to do next and where. And um, a little bit stalled up, but waiting to move ahead again. Great. Great. I'm going to save, save the guests a little bit, and, and Bernadine, we can call on you next. Yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be in this room, and um, um, I'm Bernadine Jocelyn um, here in my backyard in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, where I live and work at Blandon Foundation. I uh, work with uh, Mary at the, in the Public Policy and Engagement um, Program. And one of the areas that we work in is uh, trying to help rural communities get and use broadband and make sure that broadband benefits are um, an enabler of equity, you know, not a, not a barrier and not increase barriers to opportunity. And kind of our, a kind of a wonky way to, pardon me for this, but kind of a wonky way to, I think about our work is that our unit of impact, if you will, is the community, not individuals, you know, or businesses um, or organizations. We try to help people together in their place, however they identify their community to, um, you know, imagine the future that they want and see the role that broadband access and adoption plays. So in communities across the state, and we've worked in many of them over the years, and communities self-defined, so including tribal governments or counties or groups of townships or groups of counties, self-defined regions. I remember my favorite was the Woodland, the Woodlands. What was, the, what was their full Central name? Central Woodlands or something, yeah. Central Woodlands. Central Woodlands. <laughs> Uh, you know, a bunch of townships that cross count, you know, coming together to try to find a broadband solution. And so it's just been our privilege to work with communities like Barbara and Lesur and others um, and help them both get if they don't have it and then use broadband in a way that um, advances their community goals in, in an inclusive way. And these lunch bunches are just um, a way for us to try to hold space for conversation and connection, especially through COVID. I really firmly believe that all good things start with conversation that is the most generative way to connect and spark ideas and get inspired and, and have aligned action. And I'm just so grateful to Anne for her leadership in, in hosting these conversations. We also do one every other week on infrastructure. So this conversation tends to be more focused on adoption use. Great to see everybody. Excited for today's conversation. Yeah, yeah. And I will emphasize these really conversations. 
but it's a weird little focus today. So Ida, you're the you're the next contestant on my Brady bunch of squares here. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Ida Rukavina, um, and I've attended some of these before um, in my former position with Senator Klobuchar's office, um, and I worked for her in northern Minnesota and east central Minnesota, so I'm very familiar with broadband um, deployment and issues and problems, and now um, starting in August, I took a new position in Northern Minnesota. I'm the di executive director of RAMS, which is the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools. Um, so it covers cities, townships, schools in the um, Taconite assistance area. And um, a big focus is to work on legislation that can help the area, our region. So a lot of that focus is broadband and making sure our areas and um, and our citizens have connections. So um, Steve Georgie, the former director has really been instrumental in um, pushing for broadband projects. He's on the governor's task force. Um, and um, so in my role, I just wanna continue having Rams be helpful in whatever way we can. That's great, thanks for being here. And I don't, I, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I know Rams has been very supportive and very, um, great about promoting the map the speed tests some of the speed tests that people folks are taking yep so we have that on our website um we have a link for broadband specifically on our website and then for instance i mean trying to get up to um you know trying to keep up on things but like for instance st louis county is just doing their own test right now too so we put that link on there um and we'll continue trying to get the word out of that stuff so. great thanks 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 Mike, I'm going to save you a little bit. Terrence, you're the, you're the next, as I said, on my contestants of, of a Brady Bunch. If you want to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, my name is Terry Moore. I, I, um, I work for uh, the Innovative Computing Laboratory at the University of Tennessee for a long time. I'm now retired, uh, but I've been a long time uh, collaborated with Mika, and I would just say we have sort of uh, had a one of the aspects of the technology we've worked on, the ideas we've tried to develop over the years has been aimed at, at uh, broadening the footprint of the internet and, and getting it to uh, everywhere. And um, uh, so getting at least uh, digital services everywhere. And uh, I'm here as moral support, so. Great, great, thanks, welcome. We're glad to have you. David, you're the next on, on my introduce and you weren't here just a minute introduction and yeah um david i'm david farmer senior network engineer architect at the university of minnesota um i deal with a lot of the university's external networking relationships with like internet two and the state and also work on getting connectivity to all of the university's far-flung locations. In fact, um, right now I have, uh, we're, we're looking at how do we get much better broadband connectivity to the Hubachek Wilderness Research Center um, outside of Ely up along the North Shore of Fall Lake. Nice. Um, nice. So if anybody has information or context about that part of Minnesota, please give me a holler. And I'm really easy. I'm farmer at umn.edu. <laughs> you, you know someone's uh, sitting in a good seat when you've got a U of M address that, that that's that easy to remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's great. And David is a, I mean, I'm, I, I'm going to say you're easily one of the most techie people in any room. Oh, I am kind of awestruck. Are you kidding? That introduction <laughs> you just did. I am the network engineer. Yep. That handles our architecture without them like, whoa. Yep. yep. We have, no, uh, we have, we have lots and lots David? of nice, to lots and lots of nice toys. Oh my um, gosh. It, 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 I honestly personally don't deal with mo much anything less than a 10 gigabit circuit. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm already talking about 400 gig and terabit circuits. I'm glad someone is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad someone is. That's fantastic. That's great. I think that's going to add an interesting dynamic to the conversation. Sure. Elaine, you're the next on my. I think you're muted. Oh, 
Elaine, you need to unmute. There we go. Um, there you go. I'm, thank you. I'm Elaine Wenderholm. I'm a retired computer science professor from SUNY. And I've known Mika for most of my adult life, I would say. And Terry. Hi, Terry. And I'm really basically here to kind of understand what people's definition of broadband is. It's a term that's used so much. So many people have different views about what it is or it isn't. And so I'm really here just to listen to see what uh, people have to say about it and what their concerns are. Nice, nice. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, that's, uh, I went to Syracuse University in London. It's my only connection to that part of the world. There you go. <laughs> Jacomar, you're next. You can un Hi, can you guys see me? <laughs> yes, yeah, we can. I love when we can see you. <laughs> um, I'm Jacomar DeBach. I'm with Austin Inspires in Austin, Minnesota. Um, we're working right now with a couple of other organizations. It's a, the Digital Equity Committee, and I know we'll start, hopefully start working soon with Blandin um, just to get more resources here in Austin and also we're thinking about broadband as well so I'm just I'm the tech navigator at Austin Aspires I'm working with the schools around here but also working on the broadband issue that we have nice nice thank you thanks thanks for coming out I always appreciate you seeing you that's uh I used to spend a week every summer in Austin <laughs> with my great auntie <laughs> always a nice little place that. Yeah, it is. It's it's a great place, but it needs better broadband. So thank you for yeah. your work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mary, I know you started us off, but do you want to say anything more in terms of an introduction? Mm, I can't really think of much else I could say. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. I work at the Blandon Foundation. I am, you know, Bernadine says one of the things we do is broadband. I'm Pretty much everything I do is broadband here at the foundation. I can administer the program. So, well, and one of the things that I know that you and I and Bernadine have been working on is that fall conference. So maybe we'll right. share some links to we are we are inviting people to submit a request for to give a presentation or something like that, and we'll share more information with, about that later. So that's yeah. I'll share a link in the chat box right now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, kind of our guest of honor here. Mika, I am, we kind of connected through LinkedIn and had a super interesting conversation about universal um, basic broadband. And I'm really just kind of going to hand it off to you to, to do a, I, I posted something last week and maybe folks have already seen it, but I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. So, so let me try to give a, 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 a brief as possible. Uh, first of all, I'm a faculty member at the University of Tennessee uh, in computer science. So that's my... Uh, context. And um, I, I've been working in uh, this area uh, of uh, web services and uh, digital services for a little over, for about 25 years. So um, I sort of came to it when I noticed the web. And um, uh, that is um, historic. I, I guess the easiest way to explain how I, as, as a computer scientist, ended up uh, involved in this discussion of, of universal broadband. Uh, just a little bit of history. Uh, when I saw the web, we, we was early on and we had real bandwidth limitations at the time. I mean, serious bandwidth limitations and particularly for what we considered rich content, which was just big pictures, big stills, uh, let alone certainly not even video. Um, and I became interested in the idea that that part, the web, uh, looked like a, a distributed storage infrastructure, which I, I have a background in distributed operating systems. And so I knew that architecturally we had ways of dealing with this. And this was a distributed infrastructure with high delays and that's and low band and bandwidth issues. And so I became interested in the idea of using caching. And uh, that was something that other people were involved in at the time. I don't know if, you know, I mean, web browsers do caching, but there was a whole movement around 
the late 90s around the idea of in, incorporating caching into the network to overcome these issues and to localize content, to move it out closer to where people could access it so you didn't have to. And I particularly became interested in the idea of preloading caches and moving them to the edge. In particular, schools, rural schools around Appalachia uh, was one of the places I, I thought was interested. We also um, tried this actually with Russia, <laughs> with, with community networking all the way in Russia. Um, uh, the idea was uh, you, could, you could use storage and a local server and, and give those kinds of services, which at the time were, were uh, restricted to access to the content on uh, mainly on, on storage uh, at very high quality, actually, uh, within, within the context. So it, it was kind of a cross between electronic libraries and networking with, with update that would, would, would be hopefully timely, but not immediate. Um, there wasn't, that was during the growth of the internet and the emergence of broadband. And um, um, the, there, there wasn't a lot of interest in that. Actually, what I got pushback, real pushback from the schools saying, we want, we want real broadband. We want full broadband, we want gigabit connectivity ultimately at every school. And if you solve 80% of our problem, we're concerned everyone will forget about us. We won't ever get what we really want and what, what we, and so essentially it didn't fit that strategy. I will say Terry and I uh, spent much of the next couple of decades taking that same technology elsewhere and using the similar ideas in uh, as uh, 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 research networks, big data, places where the size of data was so large and uh, that, that even excellent research and education networks and, and the latencies, you, you still, you could do, you could, you could use what we were doing there. And we still do that. And that's where we got most of our funding. But I've always retained an interest in this idea. I spent, because of that, a, a Fulbright year, a couple of years ago in Kenya, looking at applying this same idea. We evolved the idea so it's more general than web caching. Uh, and I can I could describe that, but it's a it's a much much closer to what you would consider general networking and can do many more things, but it still has the the uh, uh, the property of using storage and processing in a distributed way, not just end to end datagram delivery. Uh, interestingly, I got exactly the same story in Kenya um, about <laughs> about the strategy um, and. Uh, uh, so that was interesting. What's gotten me interest bring up to date, um, part of the discussion always is, well, we think we can get close enough for the community that is important that we are representing by getting more funding and building out excellent broadband with complete reliance on high bandwidth and low latency, low la error rate, end-to-end -end packet delivery, period. And that is that is the uh, we that's what we have in the privileged core of the industrialized world, and that's where high end applications are. That is what people consider what they that's the club <laughs> of, of 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 privilege and of 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 uh, that, that that people are are most wanting to join. Um, the the question I think you can look at internet, but particularly broadband penetration outside of that industrialized core and say, it's, it's actually uh, slowing in many places, uh, internationally in particular, see, even with internet uh, and, and the prices are high. Um, and so this idea of universal broadband is one that came from considering this issue, considering what we can now do with this more developed form of, of uh, distributed services is what Terry mentioned, um, which is still delivered using the internet protocol, but is, 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 is delivered in a, in, a, in a different manner that supports most, but not all. And in particular, 
uh, what we're doing now, uh, synchronous teleconferencing, Zoom, is not going to be supportable in the same way everywhere. That's the important thing. But the real question is this, and this is one which, uh, you know, I think it's interesting to hear, particularly what the community has to say, which is if we want to reach everyone, everyone, <laughs> and it's really a human right, as people, some people say, it's really a matter of equity, and for some, a matter of life and death. And internationally, a matter of inclusion in the most basic of civic inclusion and international communication. You know, is there a way we can make it cheap and easy to deploy? And the suggestion is yes. In fact, there is a way, but the way we do it is by leaving out, we can leave out those services that require low latency end-to-end -end packet delivery, namely particular Zoom, remote gaming, things like this. The claim is almost everything else can be supported either identically or in a very similar way to the way we support it now, but that the infrastructure and the service can be made really cheap and really robust uh, in a way that um, is very difficult for broadband, even in the core of the industrialized world. That, that's, that's the suggestion. Um, it is one that, um, you know, uh, I'm particular, I, I, at this moment, you know, the papers I wrote, what it suggests is we can spend $65 billion, we could spend 100 or $200 billion. It's a real good chance we can't get, we call full block broadband, to everyone, everyone in a sustained way and at a price that's, um, the suggestion is if we, if we say that the part that should be universal, truly insist on it being universal, perhaps regulate its universality or this, uh, this, un this basic form, that could really be doable. And then we could have the other services be something you paid for. So that's a suggestion. And the question is, is it, uh, I believe it's clear that it's technically feasible and that it, it has demonstrated a lot of the properties I've said. The question is, is it acceptable in my mind? And, and, and would the community and the market and the, and the, the is it something that, that people would want? And um, uh, is it feasible to try? Is that, that, is that <laughs> I see, I, no, I think you framed it up. I think that's good. I mean, as I, I when I listen to it and I, I, I kind of have the same questions, is it acceptable? Is it, um, do we spend the, I mean, the, the question is where does the money come from? Um, do you focus on getting everyone kind of full, better broadband or does this universal um, basic broadband make sense? And, and that's where I open it up to people, especially, you know, I, like I said, in my post, it's, it's one thing for me in St. Paul to say everybody should have it. I, you know, I've got multiple choices for fiber. Isn't this kind of a version of the old perfect versus enemy of the good thing? You know, like, so it's, there's a, a classic aspect to this kind of choice you have to make as a public truth. Well, and, and I'm not sure it's a choice. Maybe the way to think about it is, is a step. It's the stepping stone. In other words, you're still going to have to build connectivity locally to do the basic stuff. But um, David, as an architect, you can tell us, is that true? Anne has helped us point out that in Minnesota, you know, we have a current goal of 25-3 and then 120, that if you make that 25-3, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bridge to 100 by 20. So if we make these investments that Mike is talking about, does that architecture allow you to, to do that last 20% or is it a different set? And, and, and that's a really good question. And, okay. and the, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you align with that in mind. In other words, make your investments in the basic such that, that there's some, you know, that they can move along. The other, the other side of this is, um, yes, it's not going to be appropriate for everywhere. There, you know, um, uh, I doubt 
from from what I understand to what like the precision agriculture guys want to do and stuff like that, they're going to need that kind of, they're going to need not the universal broadband connectivity that, that we're talking basic universal, they need full, you know, modern day broadband. Um, but we also have to recognize you're not going to get, you know, it's going to take even even if money wasn't the the limiting wasn't a limiting factor, purely just making the logistical and doing it is if, if money was taken off the table as a problem, you're still not going to get that done this year. It's still going to take a decade to get it everywhere. Um, it's just not physically possible to do all of this everywhere all at the same time. Look, um, look at the um, look at the uh, the um, there's uh, supply chain problems all over the world right now. Um, those are impacting IT hugely. Um, there, I know, I know people that money is not the object, but they're having to wait a hundred to two hundred days to get equipment right now. So now, some of that's some of that is the pandemic and the issues that have happened around it. But if you have everybody scrambling to do this all at once, you're going to have the same problems. You can only build so much equipment, even on a global basis, at, at once. Um, it takes time. Um, uh, Brenda, you're muted. Or, sorry, uh, muted. sorry. It, from a it, sorry from a um, supply chain perspective, it's interesting. I was on a call this morning with the uh, Office of Broadband, and we were talking with a provider who was giving the specifics about the you know uh, buying equipment now that was going to be delivered in 2024. And exploring the issue about is it a manufacturing bottleneck and should we as a state in Minnesota be promoting and investing in manufacturing like of you know, fiber optic or other aspects. And he immediately kind of exploded and said it's not just one uh, input that yeah. even if you solve the fiber problem. If you solve one. It, your question about it, America's, yeah. you know. There's all these other inputs as well. That it's well, like you solve one thing. roadblock and another roadblock pops up right behind it. Um, <laughs> and so um, uh, we have to, you, you just have to work your way through these things. And there's no, there's no silver bullet. It's just a bunch of work. <laughs> so, so, so let me just, just briefly, since the question was asked, just, just say, um, as it turns out, building out this form of edge oriented uh, uh, service is puts in place exactly what you need. If you then improve the broad, the backbone access, you, you can in fact use gigabit connectivity, uh, potentially 10 gigabit connectivity on the edge. I was able to stream Blu-ray quality uh, uh, video in the rural African school in a demo uh, that <laughs> I don't know when they would be able to deliver over the backbone. And so it in fact, I believe would help to justify and use not only building out the infrastructure, but also training people so, in the so, use of those, of those technologies. So you're talking about still building good, high quality local infrastructure. It's not about, oh, building a lower grade local infrastructure. It's about not necessarily having to wait for the middle mile and the backbone infrastructure to be available to connect to that good local infrastructure. Exactly. And also being uh, robust to heterogeneous approaches for that, that middle mile and, and backbone access and uh, robust to disruption. Yes. Both of those things. So, so yes to all of those. Yeah. Um, not to get into the, that part, but there's a sort of an architectural claim that just doing it, when I talk to people who are non-technical, less technical audiences even than, than this one, I often make an, uh, uh, an analogy between what we do now and if I were to, every time I want an orange, if I were to get it flown individually from Florida, <laughs> okay? Um, that, that's having to rely on the backbone for every individual packet delivery um, you know, is a less robust. It, it, it has a lot of good well, properties, and, but you get fresh fruit. 
but you you are relying on a lot of things going right. Well, and a lot of what we consider a lot of the services that we use, use these technologies already. Um, Netflix, Netflix doesn't come from a, a Netflix server in the sky. It comes from thousands of Netflix servers all over the place. Um, and usually, um, usually either at a local exchange point, um, near you or if you're a if you're a customer of a large service provider a server in that service provider's network um and so the the university has servers from netflix and we serve all of our netflix from the or well 99.9 percent .9 of our netflix there's what they call the long tail of content the stuff that only once in a blue moon does somebody watch it, but all the stuff that everybody that most everybody's watching on a day to day basis is in those servers and comes straight to the residence halls from those servers on campus instead of. And so this is an exact ex, this is an example of what Mika's talking about. But I think the opportunity today is about the idea and is it and would it be animating and aligning and inspiring if that if it sounds like what's happening is happening absent the the concept of what it might add up to and this discussion about the universality and stuff that and my and so I think adding this it's just so it's great to hear that the architecture that I'm for which is robust at the end right end user is enables this vision that you're presenting, Micah. Yeah. And I, I think that it's pretty uh, as, as, you know, understandable and graspable. And, and you're really good at talking about it in ways that people that don't have a technical background can understand the principles underneath it. But who are we as a society kind of? You, you'd be surprised. My experience is that those who are trained in computer science and particularly in networking have the hardest time understanding it. And that those who are not get it fairly intuitively. Um, uh, a lot of it, what it means to become an expert is to learn what not, what, what, what you're not to think about. Uh, so um, I, I'm not at all surprised. This is, this is what I found generally. And what, one of the reasons I was so eager to take up and uh, uh, both to talk to her, I have learned by the way, a lot just in my discussions and the challenges that Anne uh, has given me and, 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 and changed my rap <laughs> um, to take that into account. And, you know, that's part of what I'm looking for is to hear, hear y'all and, and, and be learned. Uh, I'm glad that it's understandable. Uh, you know, the, the, I will tell you the usual reaction I get is it just doesn't matter. Uh, even if what you're saying is technically feasible. And uh, if those issues are right, it's just not something that we can change. And I will tell you, I worked at Bell Telephone Laboratories in the 1980s when I was heard that we couldn't change the telephone system and, and something like the internet was impossible. But, but it's, it, it's a matter, I, I think one of the things that could make a difference is policymakers and grassroots people understanding and and what it could what it could mean for their communities. So part of this idea is that school kids who who are driven to the Starbucks to get hotspot connectivity, you know, this this is uh, should be able to reach them in their homes, perhaps through part of the things I haven't talked about, but even highly intermittent connectivity can make this work. Um, even data delivered um, on a school bus uh, that comes, uh, comes by a couple times a day can deliver and pick up content um, if it's a matter of engineering and, and interface design. So we're on a drone, we're on a drone for that matter. Yeah. You know, um, so uh, one aspect of this that, that Mika hasn't talked about, but might be useful in your thinking about how to invest all, all this money is um, sort of disaster recovery. And, you know, what happens if your, your internet backbone goes down because, you know, the, your, your local telco gets some facility flooded 
or you know the, the uh, David's example. You know, if the backbone goes down, the kids on the campus can still get um, Netflix <laughs> in their dorm uh, because uh, it's all stored local on the campus. So, um, I mean, I think that that uh, the possibility of dealing with intermittent, intermittent connectivity and uh, the various disaster scenarios that we have all been witnessing on the on the news uh, these days, you know, is a different aspect of what we should be thinking about when we talk about investing in this kind of massive digital infrastructure. Well, one, one of one of the problems. Have a word, please. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard to get in amongst you tech guys. <laughs> I want to discuss the health and human services perspective from a rural perspective. I mean, there are clearly pluses and minuses here with the COVID. What we're seeing is people having access to mental health services that wouldn't have had them otherwise. And there's pluses and minuses to that clearly, but I can't imagine having um, a, a system that where you have haves and have nots when you, because the, especially for elderly people too, to train them on how to use Zoom, to have them be able to get connectivity. Um, I, I can't imagine a two layered approach for health and human services because there's been so much positive this way here. And then I also want to bring up, we have winter. We have these issues anyways in the winter where you can't get out there or it takes you two or three hours or a day to get there because of winter. So the pl there's pluses and minuses to all this from human services perspective, but the pluses are huge and to have haves and have nots in the rural areas would really be a challenge. Well, so I, the, 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 the one of the problems that, as Mika was talking about network engineers and the, and the um, experts, we think about what is called always on connectivity. It's always there. Well, nothing is always there. So you really need to think about things from a either sometimes connected or mostly connected, but what happens when you're not? If you're not connected, does it all just go dead? Um, and in reality today, that's what most of the, you know, if, it, if it, it's either working or it's not working, it yeah. doesn't usually partially work. Right. Um, and so if something is broken, and, and particularly in rural areas, yeah, it, it, like you said, it could take days to get someplace. Well, it could take days to get a repair crew out there. Should you be off for days? Um. <laughs> but we're but we're seeing we're seeing unreliably here is a huge part of the issue. The people I talked to at the fair this past four days, unreliability is an issue right now because the access to what we have isn't is not is not substantial enough to have it. In and out, people could understand that, but this is not reliable every day. And you can't, there's not much you can do. And then you've got- And, and what, one of the ways to think about of what Meek is talking about is trying to increase the reliability even of the well-connected stuff. We're not even well-connected. Well, I understand, stuff. but- Yeah. So, so one, one point I, I would just make, I mean, nothing about this keeps any, community from from having the full broadband someone the idea is someone's got to pay for it right. and so the idea is not to die by def i mean it is a policy issue and, and it's true you do have the danger of of have and have nots and and i would say uh part of having more alternatives is it increases the need for uh policy to 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 assure equity yeah, Mike, um, I think the way you're talking about it is the social contract that would do we agree that this is a minimum, you know, that we as a society agree for one another and it and does that enter our discourse and our expectations of right. government and one another and then you figure out how we pay for it but I think right, you know, and we hear about it. We hear about it um, in our is it a. Um, is it a utility? Is it a, you know, how do you regulate it? I mean, I think it shows up that way, but I, what's well, appealing to me about the idea is that it goes to calling us to you know, like claim our future. I think design is very important and being more conscious of the, de, of the unseen design choices or will help us build the world that we, that will support the values that we want. So I, I appreciate your calling 
us to make visible these design choices that actually reinforce social contract. And, and I, I will say one thing that, that just to, to get to the point that, that you're making, but also that David made, uh, other than Netflix using content, what are called content delivery networks, which are a form of this, the other, per, the other player who knows this is Amazon. And in fact, the cloud policy and the cloud edge policy that they are pursuing, their strategy, uses these ideas in a proprietary way for their, for their, talk about values, they have, of course, obviously, imperatives, their corporation, and they are making use of these approaches, but in a, in a ways that are closed and they're they made available to their customers. Yeah. Um, the, the name of, I haven't, the name of my project that I was trying to push in Kenya was the Kenya Open Content Delivery Network. Mm. The idea is, yes, we, we can, by, by, by being careful about the definition of the service, make it open. Uh, at least more, maybe, you know, open to, to uh, public interest uh, applications, you know, maybe even if, if appropriately supported, free to the end user. But the idea is, is to harness that creativity you're talking about and, the, the need, and, and address the needs from a community uh, and societal point of view, because right now it's being applied only to remunerative applications or the customers of, of the corporations that can build out their own infrastructure, which, which they are. Well, and, and remember, they're not just building out their infrastructure, we're building out their infrastructure for them. Right, exactly. Um, an a, a, a great example of just what we're all talking about is Amazon's sidewalk network. This is their, um, all of their um, little devices are set up so that when somebody's walking by, they can, you know, because not everything, to Mika's point, not everything needs HD video. Some things just want to say, hi, I'm here. And the amount of bandwidth for hi, I'm here is very low. Um, and so the, the, what, Am, what Amazon's trying to do is help you find your keys. So if your neighbor loses their keys in your front yard, their, your key, their keys can use the sidewalk network through your network to tell their tell your neighbor that they're in the they're in your lawn instead of their lawn. Um, and so the point being um, policy is really important on some of these things, but also I also want to caution people that um, too heavy handed a policy, one of the, the, the things that's made the internet great, is low touch policy, um, not dictating things from the top has what made the internet a great thing. Um, it's the, um, there, there, there's uh, in the internet, there's no, you don't have to get permission to innovate. You don't have to get permission to deploy a new application. Um, and if policy gets to the point where, oh, well, if you wanna turn on some new service, you have to have permission from everybody to do that. Um, we're going to slow things down instead of speed things up. Um, and so it's while policy is extremely important, how that policy is crafted and to ensure that it doesn't get in the in too much in the way. Policy needs to get in the way of bad things happening, but it tends to get in the way of good things happening too. And so you have to balance that. I, I just wanted to pick up on a slightly different point. You know, uh, Bernadine talked about uh, uh, the advantage or the part of this idea that's being put forward in terms of basic broadband is making investments in local digital infrastructure a key part of the plan. So that's high quality local uh, resources, processing, storage, and so on are, are part of the plan. I think if you think about this from a business model point of view, you know, sustainability is a huge issue. So, you know, it's easy, you can build the roads, but can you keep them up? You can, you can put the infrastructure in place, 
but can you afford to keep it up? As long as the investments all have to come from the federal government or the state government from, from high level, you know, that's tax money that's scarce and so on. If you, if you make it possible for local businesses or local uh, entrepreneurial groups or uh, uh, local uh, charities to make investments to, to, to provide the money, if your infrastructure allows you to have local people make investments in the local quality of their infrastructure going forward, you have a better chance of being able to sustain it because you distribute uh, the, the cost of doing so uh, among all those locations, if that makes any sense. So, so there's, there's a sustainability issue that you have to take into account if you're, when you think about uh, how this thing has to be built out in a, in a positive way. Well, and, and even to that, the federal government might write the check, but the federal government can't make it all happen. There's a whole bunch of people that have to make it all happen and that all has to happen locally. Um, even if the federal government's writing the check. Um. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then I wonder how that network competes with the Amazon sidewalk. I, you know, and, and where do the network access points, where, where, for example, would mice fit in with something like this? And that is a local internet exchange point here. Well, and I'm just uncomfortable from a, again, kind of a political philosophy point of view to have private ownership of such core public infrastructure. I mean, I, I, I just have seen the shrinking of the public's Severe in in this country, and the and that I, I'd like to push out more and have more sense of shared. You know, there's, there's a public good here that is getting privatized, and you know those kind of resources. I mean, here in Grand Rapids, so for example, we're investing in a. Um, uh, oh, I always have a hard time, Mary. Can you help me with that acronym? Cab. What is it again? What's the first C stand for? Automated vehicles. Connected automated vehicles. That's it. The C. I so what is the C? CAV. Yeah, CAV. And you know, and thank goodness that's a it's public infrastructure. It's not it's not Conoco or Texaco or somebody owning that, you know. And what what you just said, David, about this little hi, I'm here. If that's Amazon owning that instead of we the people, I am not, I don't want that future. So that's why I appreciate Micah calling out this. So there's how we think about this, that there's an us here. It's not just a for-profit context. The, uh, just want to point out the connected vehicle stuff is a really important uh, section of things. And um, that reinforce the, con the connected vehicle folks really understand the sometimes connected world because your vehicle isn't always going to be connected because um, you're not going to be able to put you're not going to be able to put 5G, uh, 5G to cover the entire surface of the globe and every little corner and every little tunnel you go through. Um, so the, um, again, this comes from t uh, thinking about it from a sometimes connected or most even mostly connected, but not always connected. And because what I'll tell you, a lot of the application folks, they just, oh, well, the internet's there and they just assume it's there and it's going to work for whenever they want it to. And that, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so, so in fact, a point that, that just because it's, it's I've been, you know, it, it, it's a secondary point, but I think it's worth making, which is, in fact, some applications work better if they take into account variability or intermittent uh, connectivity, but including variable, okay? The thing is, if you have a, a high, a, a, what, a, a broadband, which is good enough that you can make certain assumptions, but they're not always true, you end up with connectivity that sometimes visibly fails. You see that on interviews that are held over, over Zoom, uh, sometimes these meetings that are held. Um, that is not something that it's impossible to overcome. It's just simpler to, 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 and cheaper to develop applications if you can make those assumptions. So, I mean, I know it's kind of a technical point, but I believe in fact that the response to being able to reach a larger market and also 
reach markets that uh, meet, reach places that that come in and out of focus um, that, that 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 have some intermittent will in fact make those services that are developed more robust and 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 do what they do better because you can use you can use more smarts you can use different strategies when you have a greater selection of resources available now you could say i don't i don't want to do that i it's it is best if I just always have everything that I need to do what we call in computer science the brute force solution. Um, but but the, there are issues with that, and there's really reason to believe that we might end up with a greater variety of services, and in some sense more reliable and and uh, 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 more dependable services if, if if we were working in this way. Um, the market has a tendency to always push the solution that's already been invested in to its limits until it breaks before a new approach is adopted. That's not always in the common good. The other, the other thing we need to think about is sustainability as well. Um, just like from this conversation here, we've got a bunch of people with video, a couple people without. I don't see anybody on a telephone call, but they can, they can, the telephone can usually call into these too. Um, and so it's about building applications that are robust and that allow for multiple options. But the other thing to remember is actually this conversation uses quite a bit of energy because of the amount of video we're doing. Um, uh, I, I saw some numbers that were kind of shocking about uh, the difference between an all audio call and a video call, the total amount of energy used to establish that conversation. Not to say that there aren't advantages to it, I'm not saying that, but um, not every play, even just from a pure energy and a pure sustainability perspective, we can't necessarily have everybody doing everything on video all the time. Um, it, we 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 will we will burn the we will burn the globe into a, a crisp doing that. Um. <laughs> so I feel like David and I have spoken a lot. I, I want to make sure if uh, other other people uh, if there are other questions or concerns or if people have been thinking about anything that. Uh... I wonder if um, all of these different organizations, if anybody has come up with lists of requirements and seeing if requirements needs overlap as coming up with uh, basic broadband requirements. You know, what, there are a lot of things that are, people don't have in common as far as needs are concerned. But has anyone really determined common needs? And there's also the aspect, federal government is going to pay a huge amount of money for quote unquote broadband. That money is going to evaporate in three years. Who's going to, who's going to maintain and sustain this stuff? As David and Mika have said. And it's better to, and Terry too, it's better to build out more on the local level so that local funds can maintain, I think, and expand. But nobody is going to have, you know, it's not gonna be all things for all people. It's gonna be some things for all people. I mean, just take the basic reality of the world of physics and the fact that California doesn't have water, you know, just some basic physical obstacles to what everyone aspires to. No, that's why I'm I, I have another question, which is, so, you know, so let's just say, just for the moment, if one wanted to pr even push this discussion forward uh, to a, a, a broader audience or to try to get it out in front more broadly, I mean, this audience is already broader than my typical academic 
uh, <laughs> audience, and, and I really appreciate that. But these kinds of things, um, I, I will say, um, uh, there is a real issue of, of getting people to just take them seriously, to think about them and to ask these questions, because there's, there is actually a great de degree, I think, to which people feel it's out of their hands. They feel uh, it's, it, it, and this doesn't have to be. Um, this can be done um, uh, in various ways as pilot programs for certain communities. And I will just give you an example. There is actually a project look, looking at using the same technology uh, in fire, uh, wildfire fighting mm -hmm. situations where you don't have infrastructure. Well, I just want to say back at you, Mike, real quick, that from my experience trying to promote and support positive change in rural places, that that's exactly what the biggest barriers is apathy or cynicism and helping people feel that they really have agency, that it does matter, that it, and that they have a responsibility and an opportunity both to be involved. And that's what, and that's what I mean, like in these core design and I, people do feel unempowered about architecture of the internet. So it's it's awesome to draw these dotted lines between, you know, the, the future, you know, so. Well, I, I, will, I will tell you, that, you know, this is what makes this very challenging. Um, the traditional internet architecture based simply on sending datagrams from end to end has a real hard time addressing this. And so many people even in the field, frankly, feel somewhat unempowered, I will tell you. Um, uh, th th this has been an issue. And again, it, it, it's not something I would, it would, you know, it's a technical point, but part of this is that there are aspects of this technology that are innovative, that we've yeah. worked on over the past 20 years that make this possible, and which frankly go against some of the usual way of doing things in the internet architecture, not, not overthrowing it completely or anything like that. But I will tell you there are rules that, are, that, are, that can be broken and that are broken. And, and, and so that's, uh, I, won't, I won't get into that in detail, but I would just say um, getting that message out that there are, can be alternatives is, is a challenging one. And I think that's kind of what we've accomplished today. I, I like to be, especially since this is the lunch bunch and I know people have to go back to it. We, we you know, um, you know it, this isn't a, you don't have to go home. You can't stay here. We can stay here a little bit, but I also want to respect that it's that it's one o'clock and this has been a fruitful conversation and I super appreciate it. And we can probably hang on for a few minutes if folks want to, but I also want people to allow people to make a, a graceful exit to their, to their day. But people have had great questions and, and uh, Mika, thank you so much for bringing this up. It's been, it's been a super fun topic. This Thanks conversation did not me. go the ways I thought I was, I mean, I, I, people brought up a lot of really good, interesting points I hadn't even considered so I just want to add from the Lisa County perspective that we're we have local providers that we can work with and the reason we're stalled out now is because the federal government gave money to a different provider that isn't close that isn't and so they have actually stopped our progress we've done local planning we've done local support we've talked to our townships and we've now been stalled out by this FCC award to another provider and uh, that, that's the issues that need to be resolved. And you're right, it needs to be at the state level, it needs to be at the local level, but uh, these are the barriers that make people feel hopeless. Especially folks like you who've been working really, really hard about it. And I think that kind of gives into the sort of the apathy that people were talking about before, but. Thanks a lot, gotta go. Thanks, Karen, thanks for coming. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now, but people can talk for a minute if they want. <laughs>